All right, Josh Smith here again at my studio live from Flat 5. Today's guest is one of my real friends, man. I met this guy a few years back, and, you know, not often do you feel like you make an actual friend as opposed to an acquaintance, and I felt that way since the moment I met this guy. I think he's one of the best guitar players and improvisers in the world, also one of the greatest educators. Uh, he just released a new app called Solo, which is groundbreaking, and if you don't have it, you should get it because it will take your guitar playing to a new level. Uh, he's just a great dude and a great player. I'm proud to call him a friend. Please welcome Tom Quayle. Oh, dude, what an intro. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, the feeling is completely mutual, by the way. Um, I remember sitting in a hotel room with you in North Carolina, and like it's one of those scenarios where you're just as comfortable talking about guitar as talking about anything, drinking beers, hanging out. It's just a real easy time. There's no ego in the room ever, so it's... And when you play like you, there should be some ego in the room. So you maybe well, need to fix that. <laughs> well, man, I just remember meeting you there at the Guitar Summit in North Carolina. And obviously I'd seen you on video over the years a million times and been blown away by your playing. But seeing it firsthand, sitting in the hotel room, the kind of, you know, and I, I know people hate when they say this word, but the effortlessness to your playing, you know, and, and more to me, what blew me away right away was, the the improv you know because that's always what i'm i'm hearing and looking at i want to see guys who you know what how they improvise and dude you're just so fluid in your improv and you have such a, a amazing connection between your brain and your hands and that that stuff blows me away uh but before we go deep into music stuff and all that i'm most interested always in how people get started now i met your dad and i know he's a really great guitar player but is he the reason that you started playing guitar? Did he put the guitar in your hand? Um, did you play anything else before? What was the beginnings for you? It's funny this actually, it's kind of a, a, a hazy memory because it's one of those things that I've been asked so many times now that I have a stock answer for it. But I'm weirdly, right. now you've asked me this, because this is like a friendly scenario as opposed to a full on sort of interview. I'm not sure whether that story is correct because what I normally say is that my dad, as you know, because you met him, Although I don't think you heard him play, but I might have shown some of the stuff to you. He's a really amazing fingerstyle guitarist in the kind of Tommy Emmanuel, Leo Kotke kind of vibe. Um, you know, really, really amazing musician. Um, and they used to run folk clubs. So when I was a kid, I would always go to, well, I'd say go to, I'd be dragged to folk clubs to go and listen to very English folk music, like penny whistles and stuff. And it's great. Now, thinking back to it, it was a really amazing musical experience because I was going out every night listening to live music, a lot of which was improvised. Um, and guitar was always a big focus of my house and gigs, my parents were gigging all the time. Even though my dad was a veterinary surgeon and my mum was like a housewife with four kids, they were gigging all the time. So it was always a big thing in my house. So it must have been my dad was the biggest kind of influence in terms of thinking about guitar. But I seem to remember that a friend of mine, I think I was sort of into guitar anyway, just as an idea. And I think I was listening to the Wild Hearts. I don't know if you if you know the Wild Hearts. No. But they're no. a British kind of punk, punkish kind of like punk rock band um, from Newcastle. So a Geordie punk rock band. And the lead singer, a guy called Ginger, is like a really, look, they look like pirates, basically. So okay. <laughs> I don't know why I was into this band. They were, I think I was into them because the lang like they were swearing nonstop and playing power chords. And it, it was like all the stuff that a 13, 14 year old kid wants basically out of their music. And I, I think um, I showed a bit of an interest in wanting to play. I think I was holding, my dad had like a really weird SG2. I don't know if you've ever seen those guitars. I do. It was an I SG with mini humbuckers, yeah. with switches. Super weird guitar. And thinking back, it didn't actually play that well. And I, I did kind of, I must have thought I was Jeff Healy or something. I laid it flat down and I was about 12 or 13. So I wasn't really a young kid anymore. And I was just messing around with it. And my dad bought me a Marlin Slammer, which is just like some hideous rip-off strap thing for like 60 pounds or something. And it was in lime green. It was absolutely disgusting looking instrument. <laughs> um, and I think he was hedging on, I'll just go cheap in case he's not really into this. Right. And we stripped all the, um, the paint off it. And it was, for 60 quid, it was a solid body guitar. So actually it wasn't as bad as it first appeared. And I, I think I learned some of these Wild Hearts riffs. And then one day my dad came home with a copy of Guitar Techniques magazine. 
and it was the second issue that had a CD on the front. Uh, do you guys get Guitar Techniques magazine out there? No, this was so, you know, it's interesting you say that. I've, I've been in that magazine a couple times, and it was one yeah. I didn't know about, you know, and, and, and talking to my friends who are from the UK, I, I'm realizing how important it was for them. Yeah. I mean, it was a really, really big deal. Like everybody my age from the UK, and I think in Europe as well, if you ask them, you know, where they learn a lot of their stuff, so not a, not a small proportion, but a lot of the stuff that they play, it was from that magazine. It was a really, really big deal. And my dad brought it home. And it, on the front cover was Metallica. Mm. Um, it's pretty funny, actually. I was listening to your uh, video with Mark Littieri, and you're asking him what the first tune he ever learned, like properly learned all the way through. And I think he said Enter Sandman. It's like a theme for guitar players learning Metallica riffs. Oh, yeah. And... Tosin said the first thing he ever learned was one yeah. by Metallica. There you go. Well, one was probably the first thing I ever learned as well, because that opening riff was really straightforward to play. Um, and the solos in those tunes were relatively approachable if you've not been playing that long as lead guitar stuff goes they're relatively approachable probably get shot for saying that but they are relatively approachable <laughs> yeah. um and so i got this magazine and in in the magazine was metallica and then there was a guy called dave kilminster who's an amazing guitar player plays with roger waters now mm -hmm. amazing actually a telecaster player as well really really great player and um he was doing a one of these style file things on steve Vai. and here's me like playing my power chords and stuff and again it's a massive cliche like, here's a kid who's listening to Steve Vai and gets into Shred. But it was what I did. So I listened to him on this CD, and Dave Kilminster said, Steve Vai used the Lydian mode. And then he shredded this Lydian mode, like three note per string. And my mind was just completely blown. I was like, what the hell is that? That is unbelievable. So I basically devoured that magazine from front to back, learned how to read tab. Obviously, no notation at that point. Wasn't learning anything music musical or theoretical or whatever but was just burning technique constantly and got into dream theater um like these are probably all the bad words on your channel it's like these are not you know these are the shredders um you know where's the time feel where's the you know but but that's what i was into at the time um you know dream theater steve vai satch all the cliches in it but, but it, there's a reason why those guys are, are, are you know the cliches that people listen to because they were the cutting edge guys at the time and I just had my mind blown. And so I, I did the, the old kind of cheesy guitar thing of practicing for hours and hours and hours a day. Um, and I did that for two or three years from, the, from 1995 to about 1998. And I had all the technique in the world, but zero knowledge and zero musicality. Like I was the classic super shredder guy Right. that could play every Steve Vai tune, every Satch tune, every Dream Theatre tune all the way through, but I had no idea why I was doing what I was doing or how music worked at all, basically. So, yeah, it was an interesting journey whilst my dad's playing, like, beautiful fingerstyle in the background and I'm shredding away. It was kind of insane. What did your dad think about that? You know, you being all all uh, flash and no substance, so to speak. <laughs> he Well, it was so different to what he was doing that, he was quite into it, I think, at the time. Um, I think I used to dro drive them nuts because I would play the same thing over and over and over again. Um, I, I remember I learned the Passion and Warfare album pretty much from front to back and would just put the album on all the way through and just play it over and over and over again, obviously making loads of screw-ups and I wasn't sure. getting it 100%, but just used to play like, over and over and over again for hours and hours and hours and I wasn't polite about volume levels either. I was quite lucky because my parents had a big farmhouse. We lived on like a small holding farm. So my parents had like uh, pigs and sheep and all you know, animals everywhere. Because my dad, as I mentioned, was a veterinary surgeon. Right. So they were into this kind of thing. And they, would, they had a barn attached to the house. And I had a Marshall Valve State 8008, I think it was. And I used to crank it as loud as possible uh, with the distortion, obviously. And I think I had like an old, dirty Ibanez tube screamer, not a good one, like one of those sound tank ones. Yeah. And shove yeah, that in yeah, the front. Yeah. And I'm yeah, actually partially yeah, deaf yeah. in my right ear now from doing that. Because if you imagine like a solid state amp with its kind of buzzing sort of uh, knife-like distortion, and I used to sit with it on full blast with it in my right ear all the time with uh, the kind of album playing in the background and then, you know, really loud and then playing along to all these tracks. So... Yeah, unfortunately, that's done me some hearing damage. Um, but yeah, it was it was just constant all the time. I just used to play and play and play. And it wasn't till later 
I had a guitar teacher for one year because I decided I wanted to do a music degree uh, to, to you know do this properly because I was so into it. And I had a guitar teacher for one year. And um, luckily, this guy got me into music theory and listening to more, let's say, schooled music, if you like. Sure. Um, you know, getting more into jazz and more into fusion. So yeah, that it was it was a very interesting journey. It was like a really quick, rapid journey. But my dad was into it all the time. My parents were super supportive about it because I was lucky that they were musicians. Basically, that wasn't their their job or their career, but they understood why I wanted to do what I wanted to do. So it was very easy to kind of persuade them to let me do a degree yeah. uh, in music. How broad were your parents' listening tastes? Was it only folk music? Or were they listening to other stuff? It was pretty broad. My parents had a massive uh, vinyl collection. Um, they were listening to Stones, Donovan, um, uh, Pink Floyd, uh, lots of folk stuff, obviously, but some jazz as well. That's where I, I first heard Stanley Jordan. Um, mm -hmm. Weirdly, I think my first jazz album was listening to Stanley Jordan because my dad had bought it because of the insane right. approach that he had to the instrument. Um, they didn't have a lot of kind of classic jazz in there. Um, I didn't hear kind of blue till I was much, much, you know, later in life. I didn't hear any Coltrane or Charlie Parker or Oscar Peterson or any of that stuff. They, they weren't into that kind of area, if you like, but lots of old school blues. So some big Bill Brunzi, um, you know, my dad was also into a lot of slide players and old school kind of blue stuff. And he's well, very, very good at that stuff as well. There's a huh? huge, I mean, huge crossover with the folk. Yeah. He probably like Reverend Gary Davis and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of videos on YouTube of him playing a lot of that stuff. Um, I think one thing he would admit himself that he struggled with was, was the time feel of all of that stuff. Um, because he wasn't immersed in it. He kind of learned it later in life. Um, and the, the folk stuff is, quite different in terms of the feel to a lot of the old school blues stuff, which, which, I mean, it's something I've struggled with. I mean, I don't play blues at all. I mean, I'm not, it's why I'm so enamored with, with guys like you because, um, the time feel is so different to what I do and what my dad would do as well. You know, these, the kind of, um, just, just the structure of the phrasing is so different. So he, he struggled with that a little bit, but he was always really, really into it. And, you know, it was one of those scenarios where, I lived my entire life with a swathe of guitars all over the house all the time. I mean, he collected guitars. He still does. I mean, my dad's got like a, a 1918 Martin in his house, like a, a triple O. I, don't, I don't, don't know what the model is, but some insane Martin that was owned by Steve Phillips uh, before um, Mark Knopfler went and uh, broke off and did Dire Straits when they were playing in a band together. So he had that guitar. So it's always been beautiful sounding instruments, really good quality playing. I've always had high quality music in my life, uh, which is strange because I don't really play high quality music. I just play too many notes, but uh, <laughs> some, something, something's gone in somewhere that's kind of brought me to this, you know, this result of being a musician at this point. Well, during that time, you know, the formative years, the Steve Vai years, I guess we'll say, were you playing with friends at all or was there any playing at school? Yeah, I, I, remember very distinctly i played flying in a blue dream in a school concert which is really surreal when i think about it now but i guess it's one of those rites of passage that ev everybody has to be in a band and play at the school show of or course. play at the school dance or what you know any of those things so I, I played flying in a blue dream i had a band we used to do um like all all the kind of like chili pepper stuff we played some no doubt stuff as well because that was around at that time in like 95 so to 98 like the same age right yeah, yeah. I'm I'm 40 now, so I'll be 41 this year. Yeah, I'm 41. So yeah, same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So all that stuff. Um, had a Metallica covers band, played some Iron Maiden, all the usual stuff. You know, it was just finding musicians to play with. Um, had a band for a while called Dog Breath. I just remember all these stupid memories of back in the day when you're like 14 and have no standards at all you know just ridiculous stuff but yeah all, all sorts of different um bands over the years but yeah it's, none of it was any good i don't think i want to see the flying in a blue dream video i know your parents have it no i don't think they do actually i remember one time um when i was getting more into kind of schooled and you know getting myself more schooled and educated i was 
I'd learned to read music and I remember playing a Bach violin sonata in a school concert. So we'd kind of, I don't know if it's progression or not, but was, we'd move from playing Flying in a Blue Dream to playing this Bach violin sonata. Mm. And uh, it was my first experience of playing stuff that was uh, very highly written in a kind of, so there was no improvisation. It wasn't a band context. It's just you on stage and you've got no fallback. And yeah. I remember yeah. playing and getting halfway through this, um, it was the Corrente, I think it was, from whichever sonata or partita it is, um, and just forgetting it and having the score in front of me, but doing that thing where you're not actually reading it, it's yeah. just there for yeah. reference. Yeah. And getting halfway through it and screwing it up and not being able to go further forwards and like doing that thing where you think, okay, I'll start again. This is not good, but I can get through it if I start again. Getting to exactly the same spot and screwing up again. Oh, I've and been just there. the horror. Of, that was my first time realizing that a gig could be really, really disastrous as well as really amazing. Yeah. Um, and I think that was the last time I ever decided to play anything. That I think that experience is why I'm an improvising musician, to be honest. You know, it's that funny. You, it's funny that you say that, but I remember specifically feeling that at some point I, because I started so young. I played in a lot of like talent shows at my schools and things like that things organized by teachers, all those type of little things, recital type bullshit. And yeah, I remember distinctly the, the switch between sitting at a recital, reading a chart, playing something down, and then the next year going, I'm just going to play this blues by myself. I don't need an accompanying this. You know, like I'm just going to, and, and making it up and feeling like I'd found what I was supposed to do. I, I remember in middle school play, playing, speaking of flying in a blue dream, two years in a row I played, uh, at the middle school talent show one year i played extreme wholehearted and sang it and played guitar thank Amazing. god there's no video of that uh and the next year i played something satch and something blues saracino i think nice my, yeah i told blues this all the time because we're friends now but yeah those days man I, I i miss those days a little bit but also i'm glad there's no video yeah, well, that's the same for me. There, there's no, I mean, first of all, I had long hair that went all the way down and then came back up almost the same distance again. It was like, nobody ever needs to see that. But um, yeah, I, I think I have memories that the playing was better than it actually it was. I don't think it was actually that great. So yeah, you know, as I say, I had tons of technique, but no taste. And I probably played way, way too many notes and I still play too many notes. But I think <laughs> there's a little bit more quality to the selection of those notes now than there used to be. There's so, a lot of quality to the selection of well, your notes. Now. All subjective. Man, we all look back and, and remember. I've been digitizing, like I said, because I started so young and I was gigging so much, I do have a lot of video of, like, especially my 13 through 16-year-old yeah, yeah. period. And I've been going through some of that and digitizing it. And it's it's super painful to watch. Sometimes I'll hear something, I'll go like, well, I was pretty fucking good for a kid. But most of the time I just go, God, this is awful and I can't stand it, you know? Yeah, it's hard. It's hard stuff to listen back to. I have a recording from when I was about fifteen that, at the time, I remember thinking was absolutely killer. Like this is, I should send this to somebody. This is absolutely amazing. And I listen back to it now. Like I would never play it to you. It's so so embarrassing. The tone is horrendous. The vibrato is really bad. But these are the things that you don't necessarily pay as much attention to at that point in your guitar playing. Yeah. Um, at least I wasn't at the time. It's it's a different world now. When I, I mean, I look back to even, I've got ten years worth of YouTube videos on my YouTube channel. Wow. And I look back to the early videos, and sometimes it's just I grimace at some of the things that I was playing and the the quality of some of the sound I was producing. It's kind of weird, actually, you know, having that that much of your you know your playing online for such a long time. It, it is seems weird. Like five minutes ago. What do you, where do you feel is the, the, the break point where, you know, it's old enough to feel like you've grown enough to criticize? I, Cause mine gets shorter all the time. I don't want to hear shit I played a month ago. You know what I mean? I wonder how you feel about that. I guess in a way, I mean, some people, um, listen to their own playing and can't, it must be horrible. Actually, if you listen to your own playing and you can't stand it at all, you know, even if other people like it, like, like Holdsworth, for instance, you know, was always renowned for, he'd come, I, I saw him, I was lucky enough to see him once in my life, but, and it was a classic Holdsworth gig where 
everyone in the audience thought this was the greatest thing they'd ever seen in their life. They were literally watching God play guitar. And uh, he hated every second of it. You know, he shook his head and walked off and was so disappointed afterwards. But Ugh. I am always okay with my playing, maybe not in the moment, but when I listen back to it afterwards, provided I'm not like having a really bad day or I'm completely drunk or, you know, just can't play for some reason, I'm generally okay with, with, with my playing, um, you know, to listen to. So those old videos, I don't, I don't listen to them and, and genuinely think, oh man, that was the worst thing I've ever heard. But what an interesting thing for me is, and I don't know if you found this as well, but as I've reached sort of 40 and um, I've got a four year old daughter as well. So, you know, you, you've got kids as well, obviously. Um, that whole thing is starting to take a toll on my playing because um, like the technical facility requires maintenance. Oh, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I play a lot of, of notes and the technique, as you say, is a very relaxed technique. So it requires kind of efficiency to be maintained. And uh, it's quite hard for me to do enough practice now to actually maintain that. The previous two years were fine because I was on tour a lot with, with Martin Miller mm. and we were doing, we did like the longest Ibanez clinic tour ever. So we were playing a lot that year. We were away for like six months and we were playing every single night. So that was fine. But especially this year and the year she was born, it's been very difficult to maintain that technique. So now, funnily enough, I genuinely actually listen back to some of the videos from a few years ago. And I realized that I have technical facility back then that I don't have, or, or I should say really control over technical facility that I don't have anymore. And it's just a time thing. I just don't have the time these days to put the hours in, um, unfortunately, to maintain that level of technical control. Um, it's just a factor of life. You know, as you get older, you don't have as much time to put into some of these things. And as you mentioned earlier, I've been doing the app and that's been a year in the works and stuff. So that time will come back as she gets older and as I get more time, I'm not so tired. But um, yeah, in a way, I listen back to some of those videos from two or three years ago and I actually think, damn, I wish I could do some of that stuff still. So it's a funny <laughs> one. I'm kind of reversing the concept here, but you know. Yeah, that is interesting because I, I'm an obsessive slightly about making sure what I'm playing today is something different than what it was before. I'm like, I'm always worried about progressing, whether it's good or bad, going somewhere, being different, yeah. getting, getting change happening and growing. And so that's like what I hear when I listen back to anything is, well, that's not the way I play that anymore. That's, you know, I'd play it differently. Now I hear something else. Um, and, and I worry like, when will that stop? Because I mean, we all have friends who, find what their thing is and 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 then they never change and they sound the same forever and that's not a negative thing either you know what i mean but i know it's part of what keeps me practicing and and working on it is i i need that motivating factor like to, to keep mm -hmm. going somewhere whether it's good or bad i guess yeah it's a it's a funny one um i remember when i was doing my jazz degree assimilating every or trying to assimilate everything I listen to. So I would go through this is, again, it's the classic guitarist thing and it's all musicians going through phases of certain players where I would listen to and transcribe certain players and try and sound like them. So I had a Pat Metheny phase. Sure. I had a Kurt Rosenwinkel phase, a Bill Frizzell phase, weirdly, which you can't really hear in my playing at all. Um, a massive Wayne Krantz phase, ridiculously, you know, big Wayne Krantz phase. Uh, Jonathan Kreisberg, and I, I, I pulled in all of these different things and then graduated and, and had a massive Greg Howe phase, which is not the way around you're supposed to do things. You're not supposed to go <laughs> full on jazz and then go to Greg Howe, but that's the way it worked. Right. And, um, right. you know, all of that stuff kind of seeped into my playing. And, and these days, one of the hardest things I find is because, and, you know, maybe you've got some advice on this or, you know, a way around this, but consuming music now is so different to the way it used to be where like i remember sitting in front of my front door waiting for kurt rosenwinkel's hardcore album to come through the letterbox and i would i wait you know it came through and i ripped it open and i put it on and i listened to it front to back totally assimilated that whole album and got super super into it every element of it i could tell you all the names of all of the tunes on that album yeah. i could you know I knew every single solo in my head. I couldn't play them all, but I knew every single solo in my head, you know, really, really instinctually. And these days, 
if I sit down and I bought myself a set of um, Sony, what are they, um, WH4 wireless noise cancelling headphones the other day with the intent of sitting down and listening to more music because I don't listen to as much music as I used to. And I sit there and I think, what am I going to listen to? What the hell am I going to listen to? I don't just grab a CD anymore. I still have all my CDs, but they're all boxed up. Uh, I should That's probably one thing I should sort out. But I just think, okay, what am I going to listen to? And I sit with Spotify or Amazon Music and I'm like, okay, what am I going to type in here? I have no idea what I'm going to listen to. <laughs> it's like options paralysis. And so some of that thing of being constantly inspired when, when I was younger, I was, this is not meant to be negative, by the way, I still love music and still love playing. It's just a factor of being a musician in 2021. You know, it's just, everybody goes through this. It's hard to consume music in the way that we did back in 1995. It's just not a thing that happens anymore. Um, right. So I, you know, trying to find a way of kin rekindling some of that feeling of needing to assimilate music and, you know, you listen to something and you immediately have to know, what is it? I've got to be able to play that on the guitar. Um, I've got to figure out what that is or a new piece of information that you've, you've learned, you know, or you want to, you know, like, oh, the harmonic major scale. Let me learn what the harmonic major scale is. Let me learn all the applications of it. Um, I think it's hard for me at the age of 40 to maintain some of that stuff. I don't know how you found that. I mean, it sounds like you are really good at having this constant journey of forward motion. Is that what you found? Well, I, yeah, yeah, because it, I, for some reason, it's it's the thing that keeps me positive, which is right. a thing like I, I it's an an active thing for me to remain positive, especially this year. You know what I mean? It's like, how do I remain, you know, in a decent mood, try to be most of the time and growing. So that, that's part of me keeping my attitude the way I want it to be is I need to put in a little time working on something and feel like my playing is progressing because let's face it, a lot of my personal self-worth and, and you know, the internal, whatever, uh, meanness is tied to this instrument. So when I put Absolutely. time into this instrument, I feel better. And I know that that's important to my well being. So I, I, yeah, it's always been, you know, uh, uh, something I dedicate time to no matter what. As far as like listening to music, I feel the same way you do. You know, I remember just so vividly writing away for records because I couldn't get them in stores, you know, writing away for obscure Otis Rush or for the Danny Gatton catalog because he only had two records on a label that you could find in a store and even they were hard to find. The rest of them, Lenny Bro, things, I had to write away for these records, yeah. you know what I mean? And it yeah. was like, I remember the record store calling me to say, we finally got this in, you should come down and pick it up. You know, and I'd go down to the record store and pick up these records. And then my next week would be listening to that record a thousand times, you know? Yep. That doesn't happen anymore because I, nobody needs to do that. They can immediately search it and just play the one song they want to hear that second and not give it a second thought. I talk to my son about that a lot because he loves music, but it's just different. He'll never own a record. He'll never have a record collection. He doesn't have the shared experiences tied to the music that we have. It's just music yeah, to him yeah. and he likes it, but it's not the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's interesting. There are seminal records in my life, like the Pat Metheny trio 9900 album. Like you can point, you, you'll be exactly the same. You can point to specific albums that totally changed everything about the direction of your life. Yep. And that was one of those albums where learning some of the, um, transcribing some of the solos on that album and, that one in particular I can point to as being a really major thing for my time feel, like getting super into Pat Metheny's time feel. And I struggle to imagine being in that position now, if I started now, not to kind of make a comment too much on how, you know, young musicians learn these days, not, not just to kind of make a value judgment on it, but yeah. um, I don't think I could have done well in today's environment, learning music that way, where it's sporadic, one thing here, one thing there, one thing here, one thing there. Um, I needed to assimilate like, you know, big chunks of someone's catalog in one go and get super into one guy and just study that person over and over again. I had a massive Bill Evans phase as well. Yeah. Um, you know, a, a really, a really big Keith Jarrett phase. Um, a, uh, oh God, a Kenny Wheeler phase. I don't know if you know Kenny Wheeler. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Amazing. Like a massive Kenny Wheeler phase. So 
yeah, I, I need I need to find a way of rekindling in that that in my life where I consume albums in that way. I have a nostalgia for it as well, which I think a lot of people our age do. Which, yeah, I mean, of course. And it's it, like, like you said, so much of it isn't even just like, yeah, you wanted to assimilate their style and learn the solos and all that stuff. But it's also just the mental headspace that that stuff, it, it lights a fire for weeks on end. You know what I mean? Okay. It's like, uh, that's, that's what I remember is those feelings of inspiration that are directly responsible 20 years later for where I'm at right now. You know what I mean? It's Absolutely. like, yeah, listening to that record and feeling like I, I want to do that. I got to learn everything about that, you know, and then all of a sudden something else catches your attention and it just changes. And it's, I want to do that. And this is the greatest thing ever. And yeah, I do feel like that's, that's being missed by guys now, but they don't know they're missing it. So it's okay. Yeah, this you is know? it. Yeah. You know, and there's some, there's some, again, a bit of a cliche, but one quick perusal of Instagram shows you that it isn't necessarily necessary for people to have that because man, some of the guys that, you know, you hear play these days. Yeah. Like I wouldn't pick a guitar up anywhere near these guys. You know, I know, just I know the feeling. Yeah. yeah Meanwhile, dude, if you want to be inspired, uh, I actually did listen to a record all the way through recently that just floored me. And I know you would love it. It's this guy, Emmanuel Wilkins on blue note. You need to listen to his record Omega. He's a young saxophone player. And it's the, it's the first record in like two, three years where I've just listened to it over and over. It's that good. Wow. wow. Right. Right. Send me the link. I will. I will. I'll send I need to hear it. I need to hear it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so when, when high school finishes and you played in bands and you know, you've had your Steve Vai phase, you're taking lessons. Now you're, you're learning music. I guess, obviously you decide to go to college for, for music. And I would assume, obviously, your parents were 100% okay with that. You know, um, did you have any other plans for college or was it just music, music, music? No, I um, nearly did a zoology degree. I was a big science guy. Um, and I actually had a place on this zoology degree. And uh, I'd finish my, we, we do A-levels over here, which uh, whatever, I don't know what the equivalent is in the US, but that's like the exams you do that determine which school or which university you go to. I did reasonably well, considering I was playing guitar 99% of the time. Oh. Uh, and I did science uh, A-levels. So I did biology, chemistry, physics, um, and didn't do a music A-level because I was a guitar player and the music A-level was very much focused on more sort of classical style teaching, uh, which would have been good for me, but it wasn't what I was into. And I was very stubborn about what I was into. Um, so had this place on this zoology degree. And I remember speaking to my, my dad in particular and saying, listen, I just don't feel this is right for me. I don't want, want to do this. Can I go back to school and do another year and do a music A level to get me into college uh, to go and do a jazz degree? I don't think I knew I wanted to do a jazz degree at that time, but I knew I wanted to study music. I think basically I, I wanted to go to Berkeley. I had this romantic image in my mind as every young you know, musician does of the Berkeley kind of thing, you know, the, the American schooled kind of way of learning. So the GIT, Berkeley, new school, all of this kind of stuff, like the Texas kind of um, yeah. you know, school, all that, all that kind of thing was, was in my head. And I thought I was good enough. I probably wasn't, but I thought I was good enough. And my parents checked out the finances of it and it was just totally prohibitively expensive. I mean, even the accommodation would have been cripplingly expensive. So it just couldn't happen in the end. So I went back to school, did another year of, of um, basically learning the essential music theory. And that was the year where I had guitar lessons for a year. And actually that's the reason I tune this way now because the guy um, who I was having lessons from at the time, a guy called Graham Young, who was a really good kind of fusion guitar player, tuned in fourth. So I followed his tuning and um, that ended up being a really good thing because it enabled me to learn the fretboard in a more in-depth way more quickly. And so I got into the jazz and fusion thing through him, decided I wanted to do a jazz degree and started that in 1999 and thoroughly thrived on that whole thing. I just got obsessed. Um, I turned into a proper like hardcore, nasty jazz musician. I was like super um, elitist about it. I thoroughly went in there with, I mean, I, I'm not like that now. And I, 
I don't like that version of myself when I think about it, but I was so into it, you know. Um, and yeah, loved the degree, did three years of that degree and then came out and uh, just gigged for a bit, tried to do the jazz thing. And then uh, it wasn't it wasn't really working for me because I didn't have a unique enough sound. And the funny thing about jazz, if, you, if you're going to do a really full on hardcore modern jazz thing, I'm sure it's the same in the blues world. You really have to be the top 1% to really do it properly. You know, you've got to be a Kurt Rosenwinkel or a Gilad Hexelman or a, you know, a Mike Marino, one of those guys, because the competition and the level that that, that style of music has approached now is just so, so insane. You know, the level is nuts. I listen to Mike Marino play. He's doing, have you seen the live streams he's been doing? Mm -hmm. I've seen a couple guests. of them, yeah. Yeah, he had he did one with um, Gilad Hexelman uh, yesterday, I think it was. I didn't see that. It's just that. completely nuts. Well, what's incredible? There's no way I could hang with those guys. Well, dude, what's incredible, especially about the jazz, modern jazz guys, is, you know, at this point, all these guys go to school. You're talking about millions of, you know, guys who can blow circles around all of us and know more music than all of us. So it is. It's like to be in a success in that field. You have to not only be the top one percent. You also have to have your own. You got to have a voice, you know, which yep. is you know really the difference between the guys we want to listen to and the guys we don't. But it's like that's you're you're asking so much of yourself to develop technical brilliance and train your mind to such a degree, and then also oh make it something that people want to listen to, you know, like that's that's a lot well, to ask. I think I think this is why I've ended up being comfortable with myself as a player. Because when I was trying to do the the modern jazz thing, it was, if, if I'm honest with myself, and I think one of the things you have to learn to do when you're going to be a, a musician is you have to find some level of honesty with yourself. You have to constantly be pushing. You don't have to accept the things that you can do. You want to constantly push and, and you know push barriers and, and figure out, okay, I want to be able to do this. How do I get to be able to do it? But right. there's also a level of honesty that's involved with not, um, convincing yourself that you're going to get somewhere that is just impossible. And for me, I think you can, you can have some knowledge of where that boundary is. And I knew deep down that I was never going to be a Mike Marino or a Jonathan Kreisberg or a Kurt Rosenwinkel. I just didn't have it in me. I just wasn't that level of a, a player. I didn't hear music in that way. My ears are not good enough to hear that kind of thing. And, and it, you know, likewise, I didn't grow up in that environment. I wasn't listening to jazz and, and, and assimilating, as I said before, jazz when I was a young kid. I didn't start the instrument at the right age to be able to do it. Now that doesn't prohibit you from being able to do those things. Some, some people do start when they're 15 and become amazing jazz musicians, just generally, you know, or jazz guitarists, whatever. But that wasn't what was gonna to happen to me. And I think this is why I got into the more fusion world and the legato thing because I suddenly started to hear a sound in my head that was approachable for me and instead of trying to play you know really amazing bebop or trying to sound like you know Jonathan Kreisberg or whoever uh, and becoming relatively frustrated with my lack of ability to do that for whatever reason not because I'm stupid not because I'm a bad musician but just it wasn't right for me I was trying to do something that wasn't the sound that was wanting to come out if you like it's not I'm not trying yeah. to be spiritual or anything I just it turns out that that's not the sound that I was supposed to make for whatever reason. And so when I got into the kind of more kind of fusion-y, you know, bringing back some of the kind of technique that I'd learned when I was younger, doing the legato thing, getting into Greg Howe, Brett Gar said again, but having that combined with all of the harmony and the time feel that I'd learned doing the jazz degree, something suddenly clicked and I suddenly started feeling more comfortable in my own mu musical skin, if you like. Mm -hmm. And that was when things really started to take off for me in terms of the, the voice that I feel like I can fairly confidently say I have a sound. Um, and maybe it's a strange thing for the person who makes that sound to say, but I, I do confidently I feel like so. I have a, a sound. I make a particular sound that's relatively me, if you like. And that, that didn't happen until I kind of let go of that slightly egotistical thing of i want to be a new york east coast jazz musician yeah right that's yeah. the thing i want to be able to do 
And once I'd let go of that and just allowed the sound to kind of form, that stuff started to come out and I started to feel so much more comfortable about my own ability and accept some of the flaws in my playing and accept the things that were good, you know. It's man, that's a uh, that's a subject that I'm interested in right now. I've been thinking about it a lot. Is uh, contentment in a positive way? You know what I mean? Like, when is it okay to just be happy with what you do and realize you're doing the right thing? You know, like, because uh, you know we all listen to shit and go, "I wish I could do that." You know what I mean? But it, it but it's like it's not necessarily a negative thing to not know how to do everything. It maybe just means you've found what makes you you. And I, I've never been, you know, as happy of a player as I am. Not right now because I'm not playing gigs, but I'm content with like my direction and my voice because I feel like I did find where I was supposed to go. Now, the flip side of that is you have to be open to that. Like, you know, you realized at, at that point when you made the change, like this is where you're supposed to be headed. Some guys never even get that realization. You know what I mean? They just go through life always sounding like they're heroes or, or sounding like nobody and just learning, but not really sounding like anything. It's, it is, it's like you have to have that light bulb moment for sure. And you have, you have to be okay. I mean, you, you said it, but you have to be okay with kind of dipping your toes in the water and you know, that it doesn't work. You know, I, I didn't know when I went down this path of like my technique at the time when I was kind of doing the jazz thing was really Pat Metheny esque. So I was, I was picking as much as I was hammering and pulling off. I never had a good picking technique. Mm. Um, I think you and I, in some ways, actually, are quite similar because we don't. We both don't pick all the notes we play. We're not right. like if you listen to. I don't know if you ever heard him do it, but have you ever heard uh, like you know Oz Noy, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Oz does two things that you wouldn't expect in his playing. Oz can do a killer Holdsworth impression, like really killer, but he also can do a full on like bebop picking everything crazy full-on bebop sound yeah and that to me has never been something i could ever do i just didn't have the technical facility to be able to pick all of those notes and have that and the reason being obviously that you want the articulation for the swing feel you want the the accents on the upbeats and you you want the eighth notes to sound the right way you've got to be able to pick a lot of that stuff to get the articulation right yeah, uh, and I just never had it in me. I just could never do it. I just don't have that technical facility. Um, so when I went into the legato thing, I had no idea that the resulting sound that I would get would actually sound any good because I still had that swing eighth note thing in my head. That's the sound I was hearing. Yeah. And you can't do that with legato. I've battled with that for many years. It's just impossible. You can't do it because the articulation isn't there. So I went the complete opposite direction and pulled all the dynamics out of the lines that I was playing. Now I should point out that I don't have no dynamics in my playing, but all of the kind of, um, all of the, those fluid legato lines, the dynamics are like squashed right down to get basically the smoothness of the line. So I had no idea when I was doing that, that that would actually sound any good, but it turns out that in a certain particular rhythmic setup with a certain particular kind of stylistic backdrop, it does sound really good, but you have to go in and have some kind of um, belief that what you're doing, if it feels good to you, is gonna sound good. Because it feels good to you, you'll enjoy it enough to actually express yourself with it. And I think one of the things that I found really difficult was I always had a constant barrier to expressing myself on the instrument because I was trying to do something that I didn't have the technical facility for. Mm. And I battled for years and years and years trying to get this kind of jazz swing eighth note technical facility down and I couldn't do it. So I always sounded inauthentic. I had a lot of the lines and the vocabulary, but I couldn't phrase the vocabulary correctly. Oh. So it's like, the language analogy works really well here because I could speak the language, but my accent was wrong. Right. It's like it right. didn't fit properly. Um, whereas with the legato thing, there isn't a predefined language for this thing. You know, I don't sound like Holdsworth. I don't sound like sure. Greg Howe. I have a thing that I, you know, the lines that I play are a certain setup in terms of the improvisation that I do. So there's no predefined vocabulary here. So I could kind of create the sounds that I wanted to, to create and it, it, it just worked and sounded and felt good to me. So I 
think there is a certain amount of faith involved with if you're going to dip your toes in the water and not go in the traditional routes with this stuff like i have to be a uh, you know a straight ahead bebop player or i have to sound like kreisberg i have to sound like whoever um have some faith and go down that journey for quite some time and see where it leads you there's no rush to kind of sound like a finished version of yourself as quickly as possible right yeah well because you never get there it doesn't end you no, know it's, this yeah. is true yeah this is but very true it's funny you know the hybrid picking for thing for me was important in, in this the realization that you're talking about because as i started to gain more uh harmonic knowledge and started learning more things and wanting to play faster my picking like you said was not up to snuff you know what i mean i, I was not an alternate picker i couldn't pick every note and get it out so when all of a sudden hybrid picking became a part of my life it felt like it was the answer for me to be able to play some of these faster things that i couldn't do and make them feel as clean as I wanted them to be, uh, but still not sound like, you know, I couldn't do the, the, the way that everybody else was doing it. And so that, yeah, it was, it was led a lot by that, that technical thing, the same way you're talking about legato playing, you know, it was like, it helped me find my voice in a style that I wanted to do, but couldn't quite get, you know, the way that everybody else did it. So was there ever a frustration with you where, cause like now your hybrid picking thing is really, baked into your style. So there's yeah. this Josh Smith way of doing these lines that's very specifically, I think sometimes guitar can be technique led and the vocabulary, like in a good way, I don't mean that in a bad way, but yeah. technique led in that the vocabulary is a result sometimes of the technical approach that you take as a guitarist. Mm -hmm. So you have a certain articulation and a certain sound um, because of the technical approach that you take. Is there any, I don't think there should be by the way, but is there any frustration left in you in terms of you wish you could play a certain set of vocabulary that just cannot be played with the technique that you have? Oh, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I wish there's some stuff that I wish I could pick, you know, because I can't play it hybrid pick, you know what I mean? And it's, it's more like, uh, and I, I, not that I want to sweep, you know what I mean? But it's more things that go across strings very quickly in a way that yeah, yeah. hybrid picking them don't sound doesn't sound good. Like the way that a guy would play, you know, uh, a cliche. You know, like I can't play that. You know, and yeah, no I, I don't mean that lick, but that style of lick that's very quick. I can't get that with the hybrid picking. It sounds, you know, and I don't want to say I sound like a typewriter, but it just naturally comes out sounding more segmented when you hybrid pick, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's the same for me. I mean, a lot of that... Like the articulation of playing anything that crosses over strings for me is really, really difficult. And, you know, if you've, if you've got uh, any of that kind of um, country-esque sound that isn't hybrid picking, so it's rolled banjo rolls, but with the yeah. pick, like Andy Wood would play or yeah. like Tony Rice, yeah. um, you know, that is a sound that I really, really enjoy. And I would love to be able to flat pick well. And it, but again, I have spent hours and hours and hours working on this stuff and you know thrown so many picks at the wall in frustration through just not being able to do it it doesn't matter for some reason it doesn't matter whether it's a mental block or it's something wrong with my technique i've had loads of people look at my technique and say are oh, you doing this wrong you need to angle this way like bend the wrist that way or anchor here and so on and so forth none of it works i'm just not meant to be an alternate picking player for whatever reason yeah and so yeah. Yeah, but I'm you glad you're not because you sound like you. Well, this is it. So one of the cool things is that you end up finding other ways of doing things that then give you your sound. And that's, you know, the way it should be. You know, you, sh you I think some of the coolest stuff that all the guitar players that we know, you know, that we all love, some of the coolest stuff they do is because they can't do something else that they wanted to do. So they found another way of doing it. Oh, yes. And, you know, yeah. that's yeah. why they sound unique. Well, in the um, blues world, that's a thing that uh, is really a pet peeve of mine is, you know, there's it's, it's the same in jazz guys who learn their hero stuff note for note who can do better. But they, yeah. they play in a certain way because it's authentic or it sounds exactly like. And man, when you listen to Wes Montgomery or when you listen to B.B. King or Albert Collins play something, that was the absolute best they could do. They had their own limitations. They weren't even thinking about, you know, I need to 
just try to sound like T-Bone Walker who came before me or Charlie Christian. No, fuck that. They were taking that and trying to, you know, do it the best they could and arriving at it in their own way. And it was super honest. And so that's what makes it great. But I think that's also where the contentment comes from, potentially. You know, contentment can be dangerous because you can rest on your laurels, but the contentment can often come from the idea that you have found a way of doing things and can be happy in your own skin because you found a way of do, of expressing yourself in such a way that the, the barrier to that expression is, is, is lower, if you like. Yes. So for me, the constant frustration of not being able to express myself in a true jazz context, you know, really hang on a New York, a, a New York jam session, let's say, go to Smalls and try and play it, or, you know, yeah. wherever, yeah. 55 and try and play with some of these guys in a traditional context. But I feel like if, if you let me be me in one of those contexts now, I would, I don't think there will be any nerves. I don't think there will be any anxiety. I would just be happy being myself. And that's, I think, come from letting go of all of those things that, well, not letting go of the things I can't do. That's impossible because we're all musicians and we, we want everything. Like we want all the sweets in the sweet jar. We don't just want yeah. the ones at the top, you know, yeah, we want everything. Yeah, yeah. But tempering that, you know, allowing that to sit to one side and not being distracted by it and just developing uh, the things that you know are not barriers to your expression, the things that allow you to express yourself well. Um, and again, I hear that in your playing all the time. I mean, I, I've seen you play, you know, many, you know, many times at this point, both on shows and in person sat in front of me. And it, it seems to me like there isn't, maybe you experience it differently, but I don't think you do, that when you're playing, you're happiest when you're improvising and you're free to express yourself and you're not thinking about technical barriers or you know vocabulary that you have to play or sounding like a certain person you're just in that space in your head listening and just playing and the barrier to expression is no longer there because you've put the time in to develop your own personal te technical facility so that there aren't those barriers to expression a hundred percent that's that's i mean that's where i want to be all the time is in that feeling that moment and so, yeah, certainly there's times where, you know, I wish I could say something that, you know, we all go through that where, you know, you hear something and it still can't get it out, you know, but that, to me, that's a motivating factor. It keeps me, that's, I'm going to figure it out. Now, I know that's my personality and it's what keeps me growing, you know, and what's interesting, you know, this whole thing we're, we're talking about here, the guys that you keep mentioning, you know, the whatever, Jonathan Kreisberg's and these guys, Oz. They all moved to New York for the same reason you would have moved to New York and then ended up being in their own lane anyways. You know what I mean? Because I, well, Oz wanted to be a straight ahead guy who alternate picked everything and played an arch top. And, and he realized that wasn't the voice he was meant to make. You know what I mean? There you and, go. It's the same yeah. thing. Yeah. Exactly yeah. the same thing. Dude, um, Kreisberg, I, I mean, we, we grew up in the same place. I've known him since we were kids. He's a few years older than me. He's from Florida, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I remember seeing him play a Strat, you know, in his rock band. He was a prog guy and a fusion guy, you know, and, and he played yeah, Beatles. He opened tunes Steve Vai and... once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, everybody, as you say, they find eventually, well, I say everybody, hopefully what you do is you find your lane. And ideally that lane is found by developing, as I say, the least barrier to expression so whatever like the, the reason i play legato is because that's the technique that yep i don't know if it's the technique that came easiest to me but it's the technique that allowed me to express myself without having to fight the instrument yeah. um that's not necessarily true these days so much because as i say the maintenance in terms of practice is not there at the moment but so i fight the instrument a little bit these days but um i don't know if anyone else would know but i can feel it but that's just a, a factor of time like anything that you do there is some maintenance involved and you need to keep playing in order to keep all of these things fresh and you know, yeah. so on and so forth. So there's that to kind of contend with, but I still feel like every time I pick up the guitar, um, I have a kind of connection now with the way that I'm supposed to sound in my head and being able to do that on the instrument. I think that's made me the happiest I ever have been as a guitarist in my, my life. It's funny, we were talking about listening back to you're playing back in the day. I think one of the things that actually really genuinely makes me think, man, I'm glad I'm not that musician anymore is that headspace of constantly wanting to be something that I wasn't. 
right. and now being okay with where I am as a musician and as a guitar player and just, you know, being comfortable in my own skin, if you like, yeah. uh, with all the flaws and warts and all and everything, you know, I'm more aware of all of my flaws as a musician than anybody else is. Of sure. course, people want to point them out to you, but I know what they are. I don't need them pointed out. I know what they are, yeah. um, but I'm okay with it. You know, I'm, I'm comfortable as a guitar player and as a musician. Yeah, which is a good feeling, man. Again, contentment, not always negative. A lot of times, very yeah, positive. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a good way of putting it. Yeah. So when you finish school and you're, you know, you're gigging, you know, around where you live and you've got things going on, did you, were you forced into, you know, teaching and educating and things like that? Or was it a conscious decision? Was it, I need to make money? What was the, you know, how did that happen? Uh, well, the usual, I mean, when I first started doing this, obviously the, the, the internet was a thing, but you couldn't, you couldn't teach that way, you know? So it was the, the, the classic scenario of teaching in schools and colleges, teaching privately to supplement being a poor jazz musician, right. um, I had a residency playing for four hours on a Sunday that paid reasonably well in a bar. Um, that lasted for about two years. And that was a, and a, like a lot of the gigs I did were duo gigs. Um, back in the day with other guitar players, because there's something, I don't know what it is, but my favorite setup as a guitarist is to play in a guitar duo. There's something about it, like all the classic guitar duos that you can think of. And some of, some of the most amazing guitar playing I've ever heard has been in that scenario. Again, it's why I'm really into Mike Marino's thing that he's doing at the moment, because I find guitar duos really, really exciting. Um, so I was doing some of that, but again, trying to, get enough money to, to live off you know I remember having phone bills cut off and uh, eating cold beans from a can and all, all the usual cliches that sure. you know musicians go through um, but yeah I was teaching at colleges teaching at schools and so on and so forth like getting I didn't drive at the time so I was getting like three buses to go to schools and teach seven snotty kids how to play a g chord all that kind of stuff but mm -hmm. these are the things that you go through when you're dedicated to the cause you know you do it because it's a way of earning a living that is having this in your hand you know and everybody goes through it it's just one of those things um you know i'm not unique in any way in that regard i had to do all of that stuff as well but then obviously as the internet came around the opportunities for that became much wider and um you know i think i was one of the first guys to i think 2010 was when i put my first lesson online mm -hmm. And um, I think Daryl Daryl Gable was one of the first guys, and then I, I was shortly after Daryl doing that stuff, and that was a whole different ball game, because suddenly uh, it's really obvious, but suddenly your audience of potential people who are, can check out your stuff goes from whoever's in your local area to anybody anywhere in the world with an internet connection. Um, so that was pretty powerful in terms of utilizing the online thing to, from an educational perspective at that point, to get more of that content out there and i think because of the legato thing that was slightly less common at that point um especially in the fusion side of things other than because it because i don't play like alan holdsworth because that, right. that's impossible um i think there was a bit of interest in that so that kind of grew fairly quickly so that allowed me to do other things thankfully and have a constant income stream that took the pressure off having to teach in schools and so on and so forth so i haven't done any of that for years now um I don't really do in-person lessons so much anymore at all. So not so much teaching these days. Is it, I mean, you know, for you, I mean, I know how it is being inside of it. We're just hustling. We're pivoting, trying to figure out how to make a living, you know, and play guitar. It's like, it, it's not all grand plans and master schemes. You know, things just happen as we move along to try to figure out how to do this. Was there a point where you, you kind of stepped back and realized how amazing it was that, you know, things had changed so drastically for you. It's got to be pretty like fulfilling and, and amazing to know you've got people all over the world, you know, who who know who you are, but you don't have a solo record. You don't have, you know what I mean? Like you've, you've developed this lane that maybe didn't even exist before you had it, you know? Yeah, it's a funny one that because there is a, like going back to the contentment thing, obviously that in particular, the solo record thing is a deep source of, discontentment if you like and it's just the way my life has panned out um but I, i'm not like to, i think honesty is really important and i'm to be honest i'm not really a writer i'm an improviser you know i grew up in the 
in the jazz canon. So I was a lead sheet guy. I would, re, you know, read lead sheets, play head solos, head kind of vibe. Um, and of course, we had to write when I was doing my degree, and I have written lots of stuff over the years. But that really is the deepest source of discontent for me. Writing is like hard. I, I don't find writing easy. And I have a constant source of dissatisfaction with, with what I write. So I can be very happy with it one day and very unhappy with it the next. And I've got, I've got you know, plenty of stuff that's, that's on record playing on other people's stuff yeah. or on collaboration records that I'm super happy with. I think it sounds, you know, again, I, like I said before, I'm, when I listen to my playing, I don't sort of wince and think, oh, yeah, you know, that's, of course. Yeah. I, I, I'm not saying I like listen to my own playing all the time, but I don't listen to it and think, man, I suck. I listen to it and think, okay, well, that, that, that was, you know, I'm proud of that thing that I've put there. And I would love to also be proud of having a solo record out. But the reality of it is, uh, for me, it's been much more satisfying and beneficial to me from both a, and maybe, maybe this shouldn't come into it, but it does because I have a family and, you know, again, you know what that's like. From a financial perspective, I know that I'm not a touring musician putting solo albums out and going and playing, you know, live shows as a touring musician, as a solo artist, partly because of the genre I play in, but partly because, as I say, I'm not a writer. I don't write prolifically and have six solo albums out that I can tour and, and gig and so on and so forth. And I love playing live. You know, whenever I get any chance to do that, it's one of the greatest things that you can do, as you know. It's so addictive, so fantastic such a rewarding experience and there's nothing that can match it at all in fact funnily enough i did a my first ever online clinic yesterday and it was great but it was a really strange experience because it is totally different doing this and you've found this obviously doing more of this online stuff in front of a camera recently very successfully obviously it's great stuff but it's it's a completely different world doing this in front of a camera as opposed to doing it in front of an audience where there is a, a mutually beneficial relationship that's happening between you and the audience where, you know, they are there for you, you are there for them, they want you to do well, you want to do well for them. And that experience of playing with other people live or even playing on your own live to other people, it's such a rewarding, unique experience. And you get to be a completely different person on stage to who you are just at home generally, you know, the, the persona that you assume on stage, it, it's not drastically different. It's not like some weird schizophrenic thing, but you feel like a bigger version of yourself when you're on stage and you're, you're being like, you're being you, but in a bigger way, you know, you get to do the thing that you do. And so, you know, you can't match that. So I was doing this clinic and, you know, like I say, it was great fun, but there's a chat thing going down the side and I'm speaking to this lens just here with a pair of headphones on playing guitar in this room it's just not the same it felt really really strange yep and i suppose it is one regret in my life that i am not a prolific solo artist who's released multiple albums and is touring that stuff and you know maybe it's a good thing now because you know that isn't a thing for the next maybe six months at least you know and for the last year it hasn't been and everybody's had to find other ways of doing things um Having said that, though, the educational side of things, you know, sometimes when I when I sit and I'm talking to friends of mine and I say, man, I wish I'd released a solo, solo album. They say, well, you know, you do have a large body of work. It's just not in the traditional album sense. So, you know, tons and tons of videos, tons of tuition content and people like that stuff. They enjoy it and they get satisfaction out of it. And I get great satisfaction out of it. And it's turned into, very importantly, as a musician, you have to support yourself and your family. You have to provide, you know, income. And it's provided a really good, stable income for the last 10 years. So, you know, it's not like it's a bad decision. And I regret the fact that I'm not touring and, you know, playing yeah. live as much yeah. as I would like to. It's been a good decision. It's just that you can't do everything. You know, you can't tick every single box. And maybe later in my life, I may be... Uh, able to to do more of that stuff and spend more time writing and, and i i want to do that it's really important to me because it's a big hole that exists in my musical life at the moment yeah. you know it's very strange to have uh you know it's not the traditional thing to have a signature guitar uh 
signature pedal, you know, be touring the world, playing clinics and masterclasses and not be able to hand people an album. And I'm very honest about that with people. It's like, you know, it's just a flaw in my um, musical career that I've not done that yet. And I should have done it, but it's just, mm. it's one of those things. It's not happened yet, you know. And well, I don't know that it's a flaw and I'm sure it will happen. I'm just, I think, it, do you ever, yeah, do you ever get perspective on it and just realize how amazing, I mean, you really have, I, I think you created a lane and there now there's all these guys who do want to do what you do and the path that you've done it. But like you said, you were one of the first guys doing this path. I think, I feel like you did kind of create a, a, a new path, you know, for guys. And I think, are you able to see that? Yeah. When I think I, well, I am definitely when, when other people point it out, I can see it clear as day, but I think, one of the things that's because I, because I grew up in the very traditional world of albums, and we talked about it before, the way you consume albums, the way we consumed music back in the day, that was everything because you didn't, what's, what's different now is that you do have so much more access to the artists that you, you like. So obviously you've got the ruling thing and the flat five. So you, you know, hundreds of people have access to you as their mentor and as their idol, as their, you know, the musician who makes them the flame in their, uh, their, you know, their inner musician a light, if you like. So, you know, they listen to you and they think, man, I want to be able to do that thing. But they also have access to you. It's not just, and just is a bad word here, but it's, I'm not diminishing it, but it's not just they buy the album and religiously worship the album and consume everything. They actually have access to you, you know, nowadays like again me with my massive Kreisberg phase he, I could have access to I mean I'm very lucky to count him as a friend now but yeah. having access to him with his online thing when I was younger would have been like I actually don't know if I could have handled that it would have just been like what the hell is going on here um you know and that is amazing that when people point it out to me that I you know people do have access to that material and they have access to if they like what I do, they can they can contact me. They can you know watch me do a live stream. They can send me emails. They can you know do whatever you know contact me, and that's amazing that people are interested in that stuff. I do still regret not having a solo album out. It's just one of those things. But you know that will happen at some point, I'm sure. And as I say, a lot of that stuff is written. In fact, I've played a fair chunk of it live before. Some of the guys who are listening, if they've ever come to one of the clinics, they'll have heard some of it. Um, it's just that whole process of. I don't know if you experienced this, Josh, but um, I will listen to the stuff I've written. If I haven't listened to it for six months, I'll think, yeah, this is actually pretty good. If I listen to it three or four times in a row, by the fourth time, I'm like, ah, oh, I don't know. Yeah. And it's getting over that whole thing. It's like I was talking about with the playing. Now I'm in a very comfortable position with my playing and I don't question myself. Like I'll have a bad day, but I don't question myself because I know who I am as a player. I don't know who I am as a writer and I don't know uh what i'm supposed to be writing because i straddle some different worlds as well mm. like i straddle the jazz world to some extent not in the mike marino kreisberg Oz, Oz kind of way but i do straddle that world in some way i've got like some of those guys are interested in what i do but also the shred and the fusion world so i've got this kind of slightly broad spectrum of stuff that i'm trying to do yeah. which doesn't necessarily lend itself well to knowing and having a voice in terms of writing so I'm, I am constantly struggling with that. And again, I think it's good to be honest about that. You know, you don't want to mislead people that, um, yeah, I'm an amazing writer. I just haven't got anything out yet. Just wait, it's coming. You know, it's, it's not, it's, it's not that it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a struggle for me. Yeah. Yeah. But that's okay. You know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You, you are allowed to be good at some things and okay at others. And, you yeah. know, not being a prolific writer doesn't mean that you are not a good musician or a guitarist or don't have anything to offer. You know, yeah. likewise, you can be a completely prolific, incredible writer, but be a terrible improviser and people will still be super into what you do. Yeah. We all know lots of people like that. I mean, you know, and it's, but I could never write a song the way that they wrote that song that touches a million people or exactly. millions and millions of people. Yeah. Yeah. Precisely. Yeah. Awesome, man. All right, let's jump into the 10 questions while we, uh, while cool. we can. All right. We've touched on some of these, but I'm curious about the answers to most of them. Number one, 
when you did first pick up the guitar, maybe it was the punk band you were talking about, but what was the first thing that once you learned it and, and just got that moment of, oh my God, I figured this out, you know, it just lit the spark. Like what, what could, what's the first thing you figured out and just went, I can't believe I, I just got that, you know? Massive, massive cliche, but it was smells like teen spirit. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And it was, man, I mean, there is no feeling like slamming those four power chords as hard as you possibly can. Yeah. I should probably do that more in my life these days. It is a great feeling of just like, like every now and then, I mean, I close my eyes anyways when I play, but there's a difference too, between man. like closing your eyes when you're improvising and closing your eyes and just hammering on a G chord or something over and over and over again you know and not thinking at all about your right hand or this or that and it, yeah there's something magic about that yeah dude i mean I, i've been thinking i should go back and learn some of that not learn play some of that stuff again because there's a certain energy that's required that you can be completely free with no one else needs to see but you can just play that stuff and be completely it's a completely different way of experiencing music you know it doesn't require much technical facility you can just go for it yeah. I might do that again. Yeah. Crank up the Silver Jubilee and just go for it. You should do it, man. You should do it. All right, that's a good one. And, uh, yeah, I remember learning that. I, I mean, I so vividly, obviously, because we're the, the same age, basically, remember that coming out and just changing yeah. everything. Because it was like, yeah, it was like they flipped a switch on MTV between heavy metal and, and grunge overnight. Yeah, it was crazy. Mm. Yeah. All right, number two. What's the first solo you ever learned note for note? Or was that a thing you didn't do? Which I know it is a thing you did. So what's the first one? Is it Steve Vai? <laughs> mm. Metallica, maybe? Who knows? Yeah, yeah. It was probably the solo from one. Because I remember watching the video and being like completely freaked out by this amazing video. Yep. Uh, and then learning the riffs and then trying to learn the solo. And the tapping thing was the first time I'd ever seen anybody. I hadn't, I hadn't heard Van Halen at that point. So that was my wow. first experience with tapping. Yeah, See, I remember how... playing that at school over and over and over again. <laughs> it's amazing how important that video is for people right at our age. I, I don't think yep. people realize, you know, on MTV, they wouldn't play it but till at night, that video, a lot of the times. And I'd be up at night and that they'd play that video every night. And it would just be like, man, this is the best thing I've ever heard. Yeah. Yeah, my brother used to record them on VHS and we'd watch it the next day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. Wow. All right, what's the first thing you play every time you pick up a guitar? Do your hands just go somewhere without thinking? This. Does anyone not do that? I don't, I don't know. I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> it is always. Something in G every single time. Mine is because in G my now. G. It used to be an E, always, yeah. That's the thing, so it's my G because I can't do that. Yeah. So I do this instead. Yeah. What about like, if you're in a guitar store, and this has gotta be really difficult for you because of the tuning, but like, what do you do when you pick up a guitar to just see if, you know, it has it for you, besides retune it right away? Actually, funnily enough, I won't retune it. What I'll do is I'll play, I don't have a guitar in this tuning, but I'll play all of the open string chords in the key of E. Mm. So, but with the top two strings ringing, yeah. just to see A, how the intonation goes, and then B, how it projects. And then I'll plug it in. I'll do that acoustically and then plug it in and just kind of play my stuff and see how that feels. Yeah. Um, but generally, the first thing I'll do is just play those open string E chords with the top two strings ringing. I just love that sound and I miss that in my tuning. Yeah, yeah, I can understand that. That, that makes sense to me. It's like, also, it's it, you know, it gives you a feel for if the guitar has any resonance at all when you let the string. Yeah, exactly. Out. Yeah. All right, number four. What key, style, song? What do you hear in your head, like when you're you know driving a car or cooking or something? Do you have like a narration that happens, an improv, a groove, a solo, something that you're just always hearing? Wow. Man, that's an interesting question. Um, like I'm hearing a dotted, I'm hearing triplets, I'm hearing a swing. I'm hearing Charlie Parker basically 24 hours a day in my head over a shuffle or a swing. That's what I hear. 
you know, some sort of improv like that all the time. I think these days, have you ever had the, um, the album Heavy Machinery? Yeah. That album has some of the most obscene grooves in a completely different way. Completely different way. Yeah. There's some of the most amazing grooves I've ever heard. Like these days, I seem to be into um, like fast kind of drum and bass grooves. Sure. For some reason. Um, and that is something that I'm hearing in my head all the time. Like I have um, this program, Stylus RMX, that I do a lot of practice to where I've got like break beats and drum grooves, like yeah, yeah. drum and bass yeah. grooves like 160 to 200 bpm so really stupid tempos but for some reason i find that fast kind of 16th note crazy drum and bass drumming super addictive so it's probably not what you were expecting but for some reason that's the sound that's in my head at the moment so i don't know if i have a constant soundtrack in my head when i'm doing stuff but if i did that's probably what it would be at the moment interesting don't ask me why <laughs> Do you ever take stock of like when a song comes on the radio that you've never heard before? Do you ever like think what am what are you what's the first thing you hear over this? Is it always yourself improving over it, or is it you're just keying in on the groove or the changes, or is it you're just listening to the melody or are you harmonizing the melody? I wonder do you do you recognize that type of stuff right away? Uh, for me, if it's a, a really great groove, the first thing I want to do is pick up my guitar and kind of you know improv along with the groove basically yeah not yeah. necessarily worrying about or picking out the changes but um just kind of playing lines with the groove mm -hmm. uh is is super again super addictive for me in fact i've got a really bad habit with stuff like that if there's a there's always a guitar in every single room and i will play kind of you know improvising along with any groove that's happening at the time even if it's like the My Little Pony soundtrack that my daughter is listening to at the time, yep. you know, whatever, yep. anything like that, you know, I'll just play along with it, just kind of improvising along. So, yeah, maybe that's a little bit of a kind of uh, uh, self-fulfilling thing where I, you know, I shouldn't do that. I should be like working out what the changes are and doing something useful, but I'm just kind of playing, you know. No, but I mean, that guys ask us, I know they ask me all the time. Well, where does where does that ability to play these long lines that add up and cross bar lines come from? That's where the fuck it comes from, is by yeah, listening to a groove be... like that and constantly just be subdividing it in your head, not on purpose, because that's just what you hear. You're hearing that's things actually a really it. super important point though, because actually, if you do a lot of that stuff, one of the things that happens is you develop a really good sense of longer chunks of time. Yeah, you know, not. Not like, okay, well, here's four beats. I can play four beats and resolve onto beat one of the next bar. I understand when I'm improvising what eight bars sound like and the changes that are happening at that point and resolving onto the one chord again at the end of that eight bar phrase convincingly. Yep. Well, you can do a lot of that stuff just by noodling. And it's a negative term generally, but just by noodling along with tracks, don't do it that way when you play live or when you're actually playing for somebody. But you know, just developing that sense of time by listening to a lot of music and just playing over it. It's actually probably yeah. quite good for you. Oh, yeah. I mean, I do that constantly. I'll just uh, uh, invent a groove in my head. It doesn't ever even need to actually exist. I may not sing it out. I may not play it out. I just hear it right now. Da -dum -boom, da -dum -boom, da -dum. And it's in my head. And then I'm going to start blowing over that groove by myself, unaccompanied. But that's the reason that I'm comfortable to drop in any situation yeah. and yeah, play Absolutely. a 10 bar phrase, you know, that lines up, you know, and ch changes time, crosses bars, whatever. It's like, that's constantly going on. And yeah. And that whole thing of, of being able to imagine a groove and have it feel good immediately. That's where music becomes so addictive because anytime it feels good, you want to do more of it. Yeah. You know, yeah. If you're not intimidated by a groove, you just can feel it and, 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 you know, really want to get involved and nail that groove and play a really great kind of, you know, great time feel with that particular groove. Man, there's nothing quite like that feeling of locking in yep. with a groove. Yep. You know, it's so, so addictive and so rewarding. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. All right, number five. We kind of touched on this, but when did you feel like you started to find your voice? Was it when you switched to Legato? Was it right away? Like, oh my God. I've, I've made the correct turn here. I'm going to keep going that way. Yeah, it definitely wasn't immediate because it screwed okay. my playing for a while. Because there was all sort there were all sorts of things that I couldn't play um, that I used to be able to play. I, I spent a lot of time 
when I was younger, learning to articulate like um, that kind of that kind of swung kind of eighth note vibe. Um, and then when I started to play legato, I couldn't do any of that stuff. I think I mentioned it before. So it broke my playing for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And it took a couple of years for it to start to sink in. But once it had started to sink in and I was doing more of it in front of other people, that's when I started to realize, okay, yeah, this is more the sound I'm hearing on my head. And I remember going from frustration to excitement within the space of about a year and a half. Like this is, I started listening to, to new players, develop, you know, listening outside of my general region of listening. I wasn't listening just to hardcore jazzers. I was getting into Alan Hines and, um, you know, again, Brett Garsed and, and Greg Howe, all of these other more fusion-y guys. Mike Landau, who I'd never listened to before, mm -hmm. just branching out and, and all of this stuff started to excite me again. So, yeah, it took, took about a year and a half. Um, but after that point... You can sort of see, if you watch the very early videos on YouTube, not that I'm suggesting anybody does that, don't do it, but if you did do that, you can hear all of the kind of rhythmic issues and like lines not resolving where I want them to and just stopping abruptly because I don't have the facility to go where I was hearing in my head. Whereas a lot of that stuff is not there anymore. I can I can go where I want to go now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, off, you know, as a side to that, what do you... When, so now in the odd occasion when, you know, you're in, you're at a jam or something and somebody calls Rhythm Changes or Olio or something, what do you play? I sit back down again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> no, no. I mean, if, if, I, if I... Do you immediately revert and not play like yourself? Yeah, usually. There's, there's two reasons why. First of all... If I'm in that situation, I'll probably be playing with a clean tone. And you you can get away with it a lot more doing the legato thing if you're playing an arch top with thick strings and it's through like a polytone yeah. or something where it's this very, like I was talking about before the dynamics where it's very even. If you're playing through a deluxe reverb and you're playing like a strat or you're playing, I don't know, like e even like a 335 or something, you know, that kind of a guitar. There's no way you can do that stuff. It just doesn't work. And so this comedic thing happens where I start to try and play the way I used to play and that's not there anymore. So it just falls apart fairly quickly. So I'm happiest when I can play with this kind of a slightly, slightly broken up tone with that stuff yeah. and I'll be much more comfortable. But yeah, hopefully no one will ever see that happen. Um, right. It's not a pleasant thing anymore. All right, number six. What do you consider your biggest weakness on the guitar? Uh, my right hand, but not in the kind of traditional sense of technique. Because uh, again, in the world I come from and the world I kind of occupy, the right you say right hand and people think about speed, you know, alternate picking speed. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about like my ability to play great time with my right hand oh. you know like to play like i can comp perfectly well i can hold a groove down like you and i have jammed before uh you came and sat in when martin and i did that thing as well you know sure. we've, we've played i can hold a groove down that's not a problem but if you're talking about um like anything that relies on 16th note groove with a pick where you're playing individual notes you're playing single lines so any kind of like uh, funk stuff or um, like parts with double stops, that kind of thing, it all falls apart completely because I just don't have the, the technical facility with the right hand to be able to articulate it. And what's really frustrating is I can hear it really clearly. Yeah. I yeah. My time feel is internally good, but unfortunately my time feel in the right hand to articulate that stuff is not there because I don't have the technique to do it. So I have to revert to other ways of playing that stuff that don't sound as good, unfortunately, which is one of the biggest frustrations in my playing. My, this is one of the things that I say to people, you know, I say, oh, my right hand is not very good. And then people say like, but dude, you can pick. And it's like, you know, I can, I can pick, 
but I don't have the control over the right hand with a pick that I would like to have to be able to articulate some of those things like 16th note kind of single note funk lines, you know, palm muted stuff, all that kind of thing. It's just not there for me at all. Hmm. It's a really big seat of frustration for me, unfortunately. Wow. All right. That's not what I thought you would have said, but I'm, I'm intrigued. What did you think I would say? I don't know. I thought I figured you'd, you'd say something about, I don't, I guess I don't really know. I, Cause I don't hear that much weakness in your playing. <laughs> That's cause I never do that stuff. So, you know, I've not revealed that to you yet. <laughs> all right fair enough um number seven who's a big influence on your guitar playing that people would be surprised to hear oh uh good question hmm doesn't have to be a guitar like a player right yeah yeah, yeah. um Uh, okay, yeah, there's a there's a funny one, actually. Well, may, maybe people, maybe they wouldn't see this. Do you, you know Steve Swallow? Yes, yeah. So he's a bass player, so yeah. it is more guitar related than, you know, you could go weird than that. But Steve Swallow, to me, I think one of the reasons why he's a big influence is because Steve Swallow is a guy who's carved a very unique path for himself on his instrument mm -hmm. with no regard for what other people think you should do on that instrument. You know, he plays with a pick. He's quite heavy handed with the pick. He's got a very weird, unique sound. Um, but he's an incredible improviser and an incredible writer and has a very, very unique voice on the instrument that I find super, super interesting. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, he would he would probably be someone that you wouldn't think, you know. Oh yeah, Tom's super into that guy. Have you listened to the, the new uh, Swallow Tunes thing? I'm assuming the Sco Rex yeah. the old Swallow Tunes. Yeah, well, he one thing I really I think the, the reason I got into Steve Swallow uh, initially was because I don't know if you remember, but he had an album called Real Book. I don't know that one though. So Real Book was really cool. The, the, the album came with the inlay card, and this is something you could only get if you went and bought the album, obviously. So nowadays, this is irrelevant. If you go and buy Real Book now, this won't happen. But if you can find it on CD or on vinyl, it came with a, a like the inlay card was a Real Book, and it looked like the old kind of like proper Real Book, uh, yeah. you know. And you opened it up, and all the charts were inside for all the tunes with all the lead sheets. So this was like... It was like crack cocaine for me. I like getting the tunes and having the charts for the tunes as well. Yeah. I consumed this album like obsessively for, for months, learning all the tunes. It was amazing. Wow. So yeah, big, big fan of that guy. That's cool. And now I got to look up that record because I don't know that one. So it's great. All right. All right. Uh, number eight. Would you rather have a great guitar and a shitty amp or vice versa in a gig situation? Vice versa. Give me a give me a great amp and a shitty guitar every single time. Yeah, you and I are on the same page on that one. Hundred percent. I'm one of those guys that cannot play if the tone. Like, when I am in awe of Andy Wood anyway. But one of the reasons why I'm in awe of Andy Wood, apart from how great he is just generally as a person and as a guitar player, is because he seems to be able to plug into anything and play just as good as he would if he plugged into the greatest rig in the world mm. which is amazing to me i am very affected by tone yep um and all the best experiences i've had live are where i've had a really great tone and that could be really crap guitar but into the right amp or into the right setup generally everything falls into place and i can just play yeah whereas if i'm fighting the tone fighting the amp i'd rather fight the instrument than fight the tone if that makes sense Yep, I'm with you 100%. You know, I'm much more comfortable through an amp that has the headroom and the tone that I need and whatever guitar versus, you know, my main guitar and a terrible, terrible amp. That gig's going to suck much harder. Yeah. I think one of the other things with me as well is that I, I mean, people might not think this, but I don't feel particularly wedded to a particular type of guitar. Mm. I do play super strats mostly, obviously, yeah. and that's my thing, humbuck a single single. But I am equally at home. I've got a nylon string down here. I, I don't play differently with a different guitar. 
Right. I just play exactly the same way. So the way I play acoustic guitar is exactly the same way I play electric guitar. I play the same lines, the same vocabulary. Everything is identical. I don't adjust my approach to the instrument. Maybe I should, but I don't. So yeah. if you gave me a really yeah. crappy guitar, I would still try and play the same way. Just, but if yeah, you gave just, me a really yeah. crappy amp, it would make me play differently. It would make me hold back and be reserved and not, you know, I'd feel like a lesser version of myself, if you like, because I wouldn't want to play anything. I wouldn't want to take any risks or anything, you know, it would be, yeah. you know, this doesn't feel good. So, you know. Yeah. Although, speaking of good guitars, now we're both have Ibanez signature guitars, which is pretty ruined. Yeah, I should. This is the actual one. Look at that. I'm holding this in honor of you. I know. I know. It's nice that this video, so this video is being taped right before the announcement, but it will come out after the announcement of this guitar and the one that Tom's holding, actually. And one of the reasons I went with Ibanez was because of all the nice things you said and other people said about them. And, and of course, how great they were once I started talking to them. And, you know, I, it wasn't hard to convince me, but man, I'm so happy I did it. <laughs> Dude, I I have worked with quite a few guitar companies over the years, and I'm sure you, as I know, you, you know, you have as well. These guys are easily the best company I've ever worked with, and to even imagine being in the scenario for me, where I would even say I was working with Ibanez and and playing Ibanez guitars, you know, properly, officially, is just insane. So I could not be happier for you. I'm like beaming over here the fact that you've got that in your hands is just so so cool it's amazing it, it's pretty crazy to me like i think i know people are gonna you know again this is after the this is before the announcement today when we're talking but it'll have been after but i know people are gonna go oh my god because it is kind of a shock i guess that i'm switching to ibanez but man it's this guitar is really fucking good but number two you're right like just to even see this guitar and it, the fact that it's got my name on the back of it and i i helped design everything about this guitar and it's ibanez like dude there's not many there's fender and gibson and ibanez you know and that those are the guitars that were in the guitar store when i was a kid those are the only ones that were there were fender gibson ibanez and back then there was charvel you know that that was that was yeah, all yeah. they had at the store i went to you know growing yep. up so i mean it is it's it's kind of mind-blowing to me I mean, I was convinced when it was like George Benson, John Schofield, Pat Metheny, you've got those guys over there, and you've got Steve Vai, Joe Satriani, Paul Gilbert. I mean, what's going on here? Does it get better than that? So well, you're to be right. anywhere near involved with that whole thing is just... Well, yeah, you're right. Great. And then talking to you about your positive experience, but then even more so talking to guys like Andy Timmons and working with him and getting his view on... I mean, he's been with them so long and... and, and just really understanding what a great company they were and people they were, yes. it made it very easy to make the decision. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. It's the right decision. It's great. Very yeah. exciting. All right. Ruling. Uh, number nine, dude, what keeps you motivated to get better on the guitar? How come you keep putting in the time because you could easily just rest on your laurels? Um, uh, There is, there's this constant thing of, uh, we t it's funny actually, because we talked about contentment earlier, um, but there is a constant need as a musician to always be getting better at what you do because you know that you're not the complete version of yourself and you never can be. And that also is a fine line to tread because sometimes you can worry that what could i have been if i'd done x y and z you mm -hmm. know um but if you if you treat that the right way there's this constant thing of um i would like to be a little bit better at this or a little bit better at that or um i want to be able to see this on the fretboard better or hear this on the fretboard better or express myself in this way and that's just a constant journey of being content with where you are but not so content that you just stop um and as i say one of the things that i'm fighting with at the moment is just finding the time to actually not only do the maintenance 
which takes some time as well, but also push boundaries forwards as well in my own playing. And that's going to come back. So that desire is there, but the time is not there at the moment because I just spent the last year working on this app like crazy. And I, I cannot explain to you how much work that was. It was obscene <laughs> amounts of work. Um, in fact, I was up at 5 a.m. this morning having a meeting about that app. So I'm surprised I'm still awake, but of course, <laughs> doing this with you has woken me back up again. But um, yeah, it's that's been a huge amount of work, but that's kind of done now. So hopefully I can spend a little bit more time kind of scratching that itch now because that itch is most definitely there. There's yeah. a lot of stuff I want to be able to do that I can't do right now. Nice. It's amazing how it's just that little, all you need is that little bit of inspiration. Like, man, I want to do that. It keeps you going for the next year. And then something else lights the fire right after that. It never ends. Yeah, the one for me at the moment is um, I want, want to get a load of the Jimmy Herring diminished scale stuff down. Like Everybody wants Jimmy Herring's diminished scale stuff. Sure. And a, and a few years ago, I did some of it, but the way he combines the diminished scale stuff with kind of more traditional rock and blues vocabulary to me is mind blowing. So that's going to be my next port of call is transcribing a load of that stuff. Well, there you go. See, and that's the thing. You're always willing to put in the work and you know you are so it's like you you know it just happens hmm. hopefully yeah. <laughs> all right and number 10 man do you have a five-year plan i mean fuck you just made this app you've got a signature guitar hopefully the solo album is in a five-year plan do you do you even think about things like that like have goals and checklists or is it just keep on keeping on i'll be honest with you i don't think about those things um maybe i should but I've always found with my particular personality that if I plan stuff out too much, it makes me anxious. It just makes me stressed that I'm, if I don't stick to the plan, I get stressed out. And I find that if I allow myself to pursue the things that interest me at the time, which is what this app was, you know, we didn't create this app to make loads of money or to, you know, to have a financial plan for like, right. uh, okay, COVID's hit, let's do something else now that makes, you know, money that, that you know, to, to fill any potential holes or whatever. It was something we were interested in at the time. I was working with a good friend of mine and, you know, it was a great enjoyable process. And along the way, obviously we planned all that stuff out, but I don't have like a, f a five year plan of, I want to be here in five years. I just pursue the things that are of interest to me at the time. And then I find that if I do that, I tend to get the most out of them. It doesn't always work that way. Maybe I should plan a little bit more, but it's just not. It's like with my practice. I never sat and did practice regimes or wrote practice sessions out or practiced particular things because I thought I should. I just worked on the things that were of interest to me at the time and deep dived into them. And that seemed to work pretty well for me. Um, I'm not... I hate to say it, I'm not a planner. Maybe I need to take some advice in that regard. <laughs> no, I mean, you you know, you just got to do what's right for you. I'm not good either at planning out large chunks of time. You know, I, I like to let things just happen. It's sometimes a very negative thing. You know, I fly by the seat of my pants a little bit too much. Um, so I struggle with finding balance between, you know, being inspired and just doing what feels right. And, yeah. and making plans that will actually make some of the things I care about happen. It's weird. You got to find that, 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 you know, balance, but we all do it differently for sure. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Dude, that's it. We reached the end of the 10 questions and thank you for staying up late after waking up early to work on your app. That's all right. My pleasure. <laughs> Dude, as always, it's great talking to you and hearing your Indeed. story and your philosophies and stuff on music. I, like I said, I'm a massive admirer and fan of your playing and just glad that we're friends, man. And so thank you for taking Likewise. the time out of your day to do this. Oh, man, my absolute pleasure. Uh, anytime for you, anytime at all. It's always great to talk to you. Well, any you know, anytime you need me for anything. And um, there will be links to all things Tom Quayle in the description of this video. Please download Solo, sign up for his classes, buy his classes, buy a fucking Tom Quail guitar. I mean, why not? It's really good, you know? Um, just get out it there. It is really support. good. Yeah, it's really good. I like it. So get out buy there. Buy a Josh support. Smith guitar as well while you're definitely, at it. Definitely buy a Josh Smith guitar. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> you need one of both, a Super Strat, a Telecaster. You need it all. But anyways, Tom, thank you for this. And for the rulers, 
If you hang on, we'll do turn two in a second. But, dude, thank you for doing this. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you.